15 minutes past 11, Theory of a Dead Man with Savages right here on Tracks Momentum. I am in the studio this morning with Yasmin Rashid, who is the president and founder of Econites. Welcome to the show. Hi, Shaz. Thanks Hello. for having me. No problem. A pleasure to have you. So today we're talking a little bit about the latest development to include environmental education as mm. new subjects in schools and universities, as well as issues pertaining to the environment. So mm. that's a bit of a mouthful. It but, is. Uh, okay, so... Uh, it sounds so serious. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay, so we're going to break it down a little bit. Uh, environmental education, it's going to be trying to get it involved in schools and uh, in universities. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do, right? Yep. Okay, um, what is your take on the idea of the Natural Resources and Environmental Minister, Dr. Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi Tuanku Jafar's statement in, that the ministry will hold talks with the Education Ministry on the proposal to introduce environmental education as a separate subject in schools mm. and varsities. Fred, maybe tell us briefly what is environmental education? Um, I think it's quite straightforward. Okay. It's education that either provides knowledge or information mm -hmm. to en encourage you to learn more about the environment. Okay. Uh, and subsequently, I guess, hopefully is that kind of education will be able to create or craft an individual that's more environmentally conscious. Okay. And um, what? Let's say, for example, it were to be introduced in schools and universities. What would you? What would be in the syllabus? Um, I have a little problem with it. Okay. Because I think, as a subject, mm -hmm. and I'm a parent too, with, right. with one daughter in mm -hmm. high school and one one daughter in primary school. Right. Um, introduction of a subject. For me, it rings an alarm bell, which means my kid's going to be tested on it. Right. It's going to be something that's going to be graded on. Right. My understanding of environmental education is a little bit more loose. Okay. I feel that environmental education doesn't need to be a subject in part within the the comforts of four walls. Right, in a classroom. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, environmental education could be something which maybe the school says every kid that comes walks into a school mm -hmm. would walk out learning the basics of farming, for instance, or right. learning basic understanding of trees and so, so on and so forth. Right. So I'm, I'm for that kind of education where it's more experiential um, mm -hmm. than just based on textbooks and knowledge. Okay. And maybe I can bring you back as well, Shaz. I'm not yeah. sure what, what decade were you born? Right. But some time back. <laughs> <laughs> but I distinctly Dinosaurs remember on oh, no, not that okay, old. All right. But I distinctly remember when I was growing up in the small town of Ipo, right. we had uh, Ilmu Haya, Ilmu Alam and right. so on, which which is basically environmental studies. Mm -hmm. Um what made that stop? Right. Uh, it's actually the main question I have in mind right now as right. well. And now it's kind of like an oxymoron that we're revisiting this mm -hmm. simply because are we reacting because the environmental is degrading so bad today right. that we have now just realized that, hey, we should bring this back into the education system. Right. So despite the fact it's a good move mm -hmm. by the ministry, it would be nice to also know as a member of the public what kind of baseline information is this ministry does the ministry have right. to want to move to that kind of uh, leap or you know jump? Okay. Well, would this be more coursework then? Is that something that you would like to see? More field trips? More like character building because I think environmental consciousness, we all know the three R's, recycle, reduce, reuse. Mm -hmm. But do we practice it? Right. So the school is maybe a practice ground for all this. If okay. every school really want to embrace and embody environmental education, then the school itself needs to have a strong involvement by the teachers, a strong drive to make those changes in the school. Mm -hmm. Just for an example, I've got a, um, a staff in my office who spent a year or two studying in Japan. Right. And she said, you know what, uh, every school needed to have a little area, patch of area, where we all farm our own paddy. Wow. And then okay. we watch it grow mm -hmm. and then we harvest our paddy. Okay. And and then we, you know, take it off the husk and all that. And every kid in that school had to go through that process. Okay. It's kinda and I think the subliminal message is creating kids that are more in tune with nature. Right. I I think these days I have to admit, mm -hmm. um, many of the millennial generation are quite nature deficit. Right. Um there's less opportunities in school. Mm -hmm. Schools focus on your accountancy la right. your 
math skills. It's good too. Yeah, yeah. But does it make a well-rounded Malaysian? Right. I think it's the it's kind of like an Asian thing, right? You, know, you must have exams. You must right. do well in in mathematics. All A's. Must have all A's. A's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, and little. Or I mean, if you get all yeah. A's but you're a little bug, I mean, yes. you know, not quite well-rounded. Yeah, because <laughs> when so. you go to the real world, you know, those A's still help you to a certain extent, but yeah. uh, not all the way. Um, so, what do you think will be the outcome of this? Uh, let's say, for example, uh, should this proposal be accepted and implemented? Uh, what would you like to see that the the final product be? Um, it would be nice to see these two, three ministries talking mm. to each other. Okay. In fact, I think the biggest move for the country in terms of governance would be to see how inter-ministerial efforts work mm -hmm. well. Um, so obviously, environment is a key agenda mm -hmm. in, in this day and time. And now, um, it's an exciting moment to, to see how we can cross over to the education side and see how we can influence that. Um, my take on, on the outcome is I hope it would be a public discourse. Right. I hope it won't be just kept into the confines of the minister's discussions. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to have some public opinion in this, like a national poll, for mm -hmm. instance. Right. And are we ready or not as well? I mean, coming from an environmental NGO, obviously I'm excited about this. Right. Um, what about the burden on the parents, an additional subject? Right. If that's going to take place, mm -hmm. um, means is this going to be part of the national exams and so yeah. on and so forth. So I think on principle, it looks like an easy move. Right. But when you look at making it into a policy and then, you know, enforcing it later if, for in schools, it could be also challenging. We're right. also talking about are our teachers really with enough knowledge on environment and not right. Right. To, to, to teach our children. Would uh, teachers, uh, would there be a dedicated teacher for this? Or would you think that it should be teachers that are already in school, perhaps learning more about the environment? I think we're having a shortage of teachers. Right. Um, so it's, 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 we really need to retrain the teachers again. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not mistaken, the teachers, I heard from last year, because we deal with a lot of teachers, I think with this whole uh, emphasis on robotics and all that, um, there is a requirement for teachers to learn robotics as well. Right. So... I'm just worried about stressed out teachers. Right. <laughs> Learning too many things. Yes, yeah. because um, you know when you get older, yeah, you need yeah. to rewire yourself again right, to, right. to do this. And uh, teachers, for me, have really a tough job right. uh, of, of molding the children's minds. Right. So uh, are our teachers ready? Yeah. I mean, I hope the ministries, both ministries, would be able to do the right assessment. Right. Uh, last thing you need is a stressful teacher teaching environment, yeah. and as a result, the child doesn't like it. Yeah, and multitasking to many subjects could also be challenging. Mm -hmm. Let, let's say, for example, um, what is the what is the feedback? Have you gotten any feedback from would parents want this to be a graded test or? Would they be okay with it if it's just if it's coursework or not graded? Have you have got any feedback uh, on that? No, we haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, but though it's an interesting uh, mm -hmm. perspective to actually mm -hmm. let us uh, mm -hmm. to, to 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 do that kind yeah. of analysis. Yeah. Um, but my observation mm -hmm. uh, with parents as well, right. um, um, with, with with kids in schools, is that they're always looking for opportunities or even ent entities out there that can help bring their children a little bit more out to outdoor environment, right. to enjoy nature. So camps are popular. Um, how do you teach your kids to recycle? How do you teach your kids to be more not wasteful about food and so forth? So mm -hmm. I see that regularly on social media. And I think these programs somehow attract Maybe mothers, like, I right. believe, huh? because maybe the mothers feel like they are not equipped with knowledge to teach their children yet. Right. Um, so I think there is a demand for this okay. among for the parents. All right. But if it's formalized, mm -hmm. it, it may have a negative kickback as well. Right. So maybe the ministry should also look at talking to the PTAs, the PIBGs, right. and get your parents' perspective on this. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay, we're going to get more. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about it uh, in a bit. Take a little bit of a song break now. Uh, this is Zainal Abidin with Hijau <laughs> right here on Tracks. Mm -hmm. One minute past 11. Welcome back to Tracks Momentum. I am in the studio this morning with uh, Yasmin Rashid, president and founder of Eco Nights, mm -hmm. and today we're talking a little bit about environmental education. Mm -hmm. um, so pollution, uh, how do you feel like environmental education? Do you think it can help ease or perhaps uh, perhaps one day maybe 
significantly reduce pollution in the country? Um, uh, theoretically, yes. Mm-hmm. I think environmental education is a precursor to right. to build this consciousness to be more responsible towards the environment. Um, but I think it's only part of this whole big complex puzzle about how do you change the behavior of Malaysians that are not sustainable to something that's sustainable, something that's not so good now to something that's good. Um, I think we should also look at uh, our family backgrounds as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I you know I've, I've been to a Pasar Malam, and I keep telling this, sharing this example. Right. Um, I saw this kid with an ice cream stick and a wrapper, and he was actually uh, walking with his dad. Mm-hmm. And I heard him ask, you know, Ayah, mm-hmm. mana nak buang right. sampah ni? And I felt like it was nice of that boy to be more conscious about finding a proper place to throw his rubbish. Right. And then two seconds later, I heard his dad say, buang je kat mana mana. Right. And that kind of was heartbreaking. So yeah. for me, and I always tell my kids this, it's good that what you learn in school, uh, you know, you get tested on, you, mm. you know, the big concept of recycling and so on. But at home, do you practice this as well? Right. Um, and I think that's one element which we all really need to pay attention to. If we want the next generation to be leading by example, we mm. ex- ourselves have to be good examples now. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's one uh, from the from being a parent mm-hmm. and starting from home. The second thing is maybe uh, if you take this to a mac- macro level, they're looking at enforcement. Right. So if you're very serious about people not littering, then the necessary actions need to be taken to, not to say punish, but mm-hmm. to, to ensure this doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So the local authorities and all that should also make sure that they mean it seriously, right. not just a slap on the wrist and mm. you can go on polluting, right. just pay a fine, then you're okay, la, you continue your business as usual. Right. So this, these two um, elements, I think, is as critical as making sure that environmental education is formalized into a system. Okay, so for example, if somebody does litter, what do you think is a proper repercussion for that? Um, if you take the Singapore concept, right. um, they don't even have, I think, enforcement officers around. They just have cameras right. all over. Right, right. Um, okay. And I, I believe if you smoke in an area where you're not supposed to smoke, mm-hmm. the next thing you know, you just get a piece of fine in the mail mm-hmm. with a picture of you smoking right. and basically saying, pay up because you're not supposed to be doing that in that area. Right. Um, of course, that's really high level of enforcement, yeah. almost like digitized and all that. It doesn't yeah. really need met people human power in it and mm-hmm. um, maybe it's time to look at that way right. uh, you know because our eyes cannot be everywhere mm-hmm. where these acts happen right. so imagine a factory illegally throwing something along yeah. a river yes. but if we can bring the monitoring to a whole new level mm-hmm. whether to drone technology right. some little microbes by the rivers you know that can sense these kind of changes yeah. and it's not even sci-fi it's very doable today yes. you know so we can we are able to have better actions with this once we know what we're monitoring yeah i think that's that's very true there's a video that went viral recently of somebody throwing something into a drain uh, i think there's even uh, I, there's been a story that i hear in certain um uh flats for example people just throw their food out the window and it falls on the car oh, <laughs> I've, parked downstairs. I've got a friend who lives in a flat in the Stamansara area yeah. I think uh, a TV flew off the 14th floor oh, once okay. I don't know whether it was a shortcut for them to recycle <laughs> or not but, <laughs> um, but yeah you know right. uh, so these people mm. civic consciousness right. I think yeah. even before we talk about environmental education can, yeah. can we instill some sort of civic consciousness because yeah. I think littering and all that it's uh, human behavior that needs to be curbed right. uh, the byproduct is it harms the environment right. but why we need to address it from the fundamental perspective it's really about civic consciousness right. if you think about it is it a not my problem kind of attitude or what do you think? Can you see uh, how, how do we like slowly? Obviously, this can't be done overnight. Um, but if there's a way to slowly, perhaps, change this pro- problem, would it be through environmental education or what? Do education you think? definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Education is definitely something that needs to be there. Mm-hmm. But we cannot simply assume the results can be seen after a year as yeah. well. We've got to monitor the impact on the child maybe over in a longitudinal mm. kind of time, maybe after five years, ten years. Right. So assuming we start environmental education next year for primary one, mm-hmm. to measure the real outcomes to see 
at from five seventeen years old mm-hmm. has this kid um, been monitored in terms of his or her responsiveness towards environmental stimuli? Right. So how do we measure this? This is something I guess the ministry needs to look at. Right. Um, and also I guess make sure that by introducing this, uh, it it actually works, you know, for our children. Right. So it's a lot of homework to be done for the ministries. Actually, it's a great idea with the mechanics and processes. Yeah. Do you think perhaps we Malaysians in general we're taking this issue seriously enough? No. Not yet. No. I mean, definitely more today yeah. than ten years ago. Right. But it's still not pushing, putting the right pressure at the right places, lah. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll come back. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, right now, though, I understand that you're a big Beatles fan. Uh, so coming up right <laughs> yes. now is the Beatles come together right here on Thank tracks. You. Thank you. So we get to the top of the hour. Then speaking dark with the way you are, I'm in the studio today with uh, Yasmin Rashid, our president and founder of Eco Nights. Uh, what are Eco Nights uh, activities for 2017? What do you have planned? Uh, well, uh, one key activity that we're doing to promote more sustainable lifestyle and responsible consumerism is happening. This well, actually, yeah, the, uh, three weeks from now, it's called the Green Market. Okay. So what it is is basically nine days of uh, a festival fairground mm-hmm. where. We are promoting uh, green products and services, and we're creating a festival out of it so that people and their families, uh, you know, can bring their children to kind of look at sustainable products and services from a different perspective. I mean, okay. uh, a lot of the things based on lifestyle choices mm-hmm. are quite detrimental to the environment. Right. For instance, just a small case is the use of plastic bags. Right. Um, and I think Malaysians just need to be a bit more aware and educated on where to look for products or services that are just a bit more responsible towards the environment. Right. So the green market will feature these brands. It mm-hmm. will also feature a lot of NGOs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we realized that over the years that uh, Malaysians are keen to help or volunteer for environmental right. causes. But it stops there. They show interest. But the next step is about engaging the NGO engine in the programs. They fall short of it. Mm-hmm. So we hope that we can encourage more people to come to the green market and talk them talk with the NGOs themselves mm-hmm. to find out how they can contribute directly to their own actions. Okay. So that's one thing that's happening in the month of March. Um, throughout the entire year, we've got several sustainability camps lined up for children, for teenagers. Uh, we also have the Kuala Lumpur Eco Film Festival coming up in October, which probably I'll right. share with you later on yeah. in, in, in the months. Right. Um, but uh, rest assured, I think we're not the only environmental NGO in town that's mm-hmm. uh, got a packed full year-round of agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, other NGOs are also working very, very aggressively in these kind of areas. Um, one of the key things I'd like to share is, is this whole buzzword about what is the Sustainable Development Goals. Right. Which you will see the prime minister and other ministers mentioning this, this, this three words very regularly. So we will be embarking on very good concerted efforts among the NGOs to try to educate Malaysians on what are the sustainable development goals. I think it's critical because a lot of Malaysian policies, new policies, are going to take these goals into consideration, mm-hmm. which is essentially is about making the entire planet more sustainably managed. Right. So, it's a long word, it's a big word, um, but how do you then communicate it to people in the grassroots to make mm-hmm. sure they feel for this effort as well? Okay. Yeah, uh, early on you were talking about um, how certain lifestyle choices Malaysians make are actually detrimental to the environment, such as plastic bags for example. Mm-hmm. What do you think is perhaps the, uh, the compromise that you can make? Because um, perhaps... Um, uh, people still need plastic bags if they go to do shopping. But what do you think is a is a compromise, perhaps? I think a compromise would be to look at what you can avoid in the first place. Right. Because uh, a lot of people say, you know, Yasmin, it's so difficult to recycle. There are no recycling facility and all right. that. And I always go back to, well, you know, in, to avoid recycling, because mm-hmm. it is tedious, can you maybe look at reducing? Right. Um, and for instance, if you know you're going to go shop, if you don't have a bag, mm-hmm. and if it can wait, maybe you can go back and get a bag and shop some other day. Right. So these are really actually simple, sensible solutions. Okay. But because it's not to our convenience right. uh, anymore, mm-hmm. it becomes a hindrance. Yeah. And I really urge you know your, your listeners especially mm-hmm. to just really think about what kind of decision that you can make within your own power, mm-hmm. uh, which 
can avoid all these, um, you know, grouses about, oh, yeah. Yeah, so difficult to recycle, yeah. or recycling man, I don't trust. You know, there's <laughs> always a million right, reasons right. not to recycle. Yeah. But if you don't want to recycle, then maybe don't take that plastic back in the first place, you right. know. Don't take those papers in the first place. Right. Oh, what about paper bags? Is that is, do you think that maybe the companies that uh, you know like provide plastic bags should give a more eco-friendly alternative? Mm, I think the alternative should come from the consumers. consumers. I mean, I okay. think it's quite a burden on the businesses. Right. Um, they're trying their best, but mm -hmm. you know sometimes they also have to bend their rules because customers demand for this. Right. But I feel that as a consumer, I think that's the critical part. How mm -hmm. do you? raise enough awareness in the consumer to make them take that action. Right. I mean, I don't know about you, but most events I go, even weddings and all, you always get these goodie bags. Right. And I bet in a year you at least have 10 lying around at home. <laughs> if you can just organize these bags and sort it out and put right. it at places where you need it, right. there's really no need for plastic bags. You would right. have enough. Um, some shops I go to for grocery shopping, they, they give me cardboard boxes, you know, because when they take out their products and put in a shelf, right. they're always left with a lot of cardboard boxes. Right. I prefer the cardboard boxes because it fits nicely in my trunk, nothing <laughs> moves and everything. Yes, yes. And I bring those boxes back again to refill my groceries. Right. Uh, so they're permanently in the car. And I think this is the kind of lifestyle, uh, you know, when you start changing and your kids observe you, mm -hmm naturally it becomes something that's second nature for them. Yeah, so, so now how do we make our children care for the environment like it's second nature? And that's right. a tricky question here. So that's envir another form of environmental education. Then, yes, right? yeah. monkey see, monkey do, you yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, if let's say for example somebody would like to get uh, more information or maybe they want to ask you some questions about uh, environmental education, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Well, you can get quite a lot of resources from our website, econites.org.my. We do have a link where if you sign on or log on, mm -hmm. and you can download a lot of high resolution materials which you, if you're a teacher or you're a kindergarten teacher or you just want to educate some people in your office about recycling, these materials are available for free downloads. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, it's always best to be on social media. Right. So our Facebook is quite dynamic. If you have any questions, uh, just send us a message. Mm -hmm. If you like to have a workshop done for your community, right. to teach them how to recycle, to teach them how to compost, we're always ready to, to do that. Okay. And lastly, Eco Nights' office is also a community recycling center. Mm -hmm. And if you like to find out what we accept, from used cooking oil to electronic gadgets to papers, old clothing, uh, do send us an email or, or call us in the office and we would be more than happy to, to help the, the general public. Okay, so that's Eco Nights, that's E-C-O-K-N-I-G-H-T-S. So Correct. That's knights, as in knights in shining armor. Correct. So, uh, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Thank you, uh, Yasmin Rashid, President and Founder of Eco Nights. Uh, go and look them up online and mm -hmm. check out their Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, Shas. It's been it, fun. It has been a pleasure. Uh, stay tuned for the news at noon with Surya. Coming up right now is POD, Youth of the Nation, right here on Tracks. <laughs>